opportunity to come here and uh, tell a little bit about Keena's story and uh, uh, that's uh, of our transformation over the last couple of years. Look, I, I always like coming to events such as these as well because it's good to talk about uh, our friends and partners, our investment partners in Keena and, and I also like to talk about the opportunities of investment in Papua New Guinea. I, I've been there quite a while and I think you know, we've heard lots of stories about Papua New Guinea over time, but we do, it is a good place to invest for the long term, I believe. I see it as part of um, what I do at Kena, is to go around and um, tell people about the Kena story and also talk about these opportunities in Papua New Guinea. Can I say from the outset that the Kena success story has been built on a clear um, vision to help um, our customers and communities prosper, underpinned by progressive and accessible financial services. <clears throat> the Kena story uh, started from humble beginnings about 30 years ago as a small funds administrator and stockbroker. <clears throat> but from these beginnings, we wanted to become a, a model diversified financial services organisation. We had a vision and a plan to achieve what we have done now. Even those, when I got involved in 1997, those 20 years ago, we sat, I sat down with our team, we worked out where we wanted to go and where, what we wanted to be. In those days, <coughs> we had a little office down in, um, in um, Connie Dober. We had um, seven people on two computers, I think, and we had a, a clear vision where we wanted to go. Today, I think we have uh, about 320 people. We really embarked on our transformational journey when we made the announcement that we were going to uh, buy the banking operations of Maybank in Papua New Guinea. That was in May um, 2015. For us, this was the missing piece of the puzzle. We'd already had some financial, you know, the wealth management side uh, of our business, so we knew, and we were the biggest non-bank lender. Following that acquisition, um, we... Uh, undertook an IPO um, for Kena shares to be listed on the ASX and, and POMSOX. And this occurred at the end of July 2015. I recall that, you know, when I moved around the investment markets for our listing, I remember the key challenges was convincing investors outside Papua New Guinea that Kena was a good business and that Papua New Guinea was a good place to invest. Together with Morgan's our advisor, I think John Polinelli's here today, and we put a plan in place. And, and it, this didn't, we just didn't suddenly wake up and this is what we were going to do. We had a plan that we wanted to do this and we, we worked out that we said for, for six months before we even talked about um, doing an IPO, we went out and talked to investors that possibly had a, an appetite to invest in places like Papua New Guinea. We talked about... Papua New Guinea. We talked about trying to dispel some of the perceptions. That was even before we started talking about um, the Kena story itself. So it was really important to get that out of the way. For me, the critical element of becoming the model financial services company we wanted to be was a compliance and governance regime which could stand up to all the scrutiny, not just here in, uh, not just in Papua New Guinea, but anywhere in the world. And I think this approach put us in good stead for our ASX listing and our life as a listed company. We hold a number of financial institutions and we need to be compliant when we've got ASX, POM, SOX, everything that you need to do. So we embrace compliance. We need to be. And we need to show that our compliance regimes can be as good as anywhere else. Kena did successfully list on the ASX but I can tell you that convincing the investment community and the media about Papua New Guinea is still a challenging task, as other Papua New Guinea companies have found. That is why even today, when I'm speaking with some of our investors, I try to provide some context around Papua New Guinea and the challenge what are sometimes entrenched, out of date or uninformed, um, uninformed views of Papua New Guinea. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what, uh, what Kena looks like today. So with our successful listing, there was a lot, quite a lot of change to us. Um, one thing that I really did notice, it was a bit like what I call the fishbowl effect. It was uh, terminology given to me by someone at Morgan's. 
because of all our compliance requirements with the ISX, um, POM SOX, uh, we have to do a deal of APRA, ASIC, uh, the Bank of Papua New Guinea. Well, the, the corporate advice said it's going to be like standing in a fishbowl naked because everyone looks at everything that you've done. It has to be open, transparent and everything. So it's always been a bit scary in that part of the thing. We went from being Papua New Guinea's largest non-bank lender to the smallest bank lender. That was quite a change in perspective for us. This is what we look like today. We're the smallest bank in Papua New Guinea with more than 14,000 clients. We have seven branches and offices and we have provision for access uh, to a, an extensive ATM and FPOS network for our customers. Following our recent win of the NAS Fund uh, mandate for their fund administration services, we are now the largest fund administrator business in Papua New Guinea, with 9.5 billion in funds under administration, representing more than 700,000 members. In fact, if you compare that with the Australian industry terms, Kina would rank as the third largest outsourced provider of funds administration services. So it's quite a significant size. We are the largest fund management business in Papua New Guinea of 6.9 billion in funds under management. Looking ahead, there are a number of attractive growth opportunities for Kina. The first of these I'd like to talk about is our existing customers. Up until recently, we, we've never been, we, we've never, when we acquired the Maybank business, we, they didn't connect with any other bank in Papua New Guinea. So their ATMs, uh, they, they, if you're a cardholder of, of uh, the old Maybank franchise, you could use your, uh, the Maybank ATMs, but you couldn't use any other ATM in Papua New Guinea and you couldn't use any FPOS machines. We've gone about uh, doing that and we've got that in place. We're also in the process of doing a major system upgrade. Their old system was about eight years old and they hadn't upgraded it for a, quite a number of years. So we will have, uh, in the next month or so, we'll have our system, core system, banking system upgraded. We'll be able to provide um, new mobile banking platforms, uh, corporate banking app, uh, apps. So essentially what that means is that we'll be able to look after all our customer needs. Kina's recent, um, I talked about the uh, acquisition of the NAS Fund um, Funds Administration. I mean, part of us winning that deal was to enable us to provide some banking services to those clients as well. So that's an opportunity. It also provides a much larger customer base for Kina. And we are now able to leverage relationships, not just with NAS Fund, but all the major superannuation funds, including Number One Super and Comrade Trustee Services. This provides exciting opportunities to provide targeted wealth management and banking products to a greatly expanded group of people. Papua New Guinea doesn't really have a financial planning business industry, so, and over the years with the regulation and that has come into place, it is coming about that Papua New Guineans now just don't rely on superannuation um, for their retirement. They're looking at other opportunities as well. We've enhanced our service to our customers over the past year through uh, getting the internet uh, interconnect banking um, um, uh, infrastructure agreement signed so that we can now can use all the ATM machines in the country and all the FPOS machines in the country. I think that's about 12,000 FPOS machines around the country. We also see opportunities to expand and upgrade our branch network. Um, we will do that selectively in places where we can do that. Um, um, uh, I don't see that uh, the way of having bank branches all around the country is the future, um, but we will open select branches in selected places. An example of that is that we opened our, um, our new flagship branch uh, recently in uh, Vision City. It was, um, it was uh, back in May, and since that time we've had uh, really great growth in that, um, in that branch. It's been designed with our customer needs in, in mind, so it's more principally not focused on transactions, it's mostly for, say, interactions where we have customers come in, we have a, a wealth management area and, uh, and a loans area where customers can come and sit down and interact. The focus is definitely not on transactions. We prefer that our customers, when they're doing their everyday transactions, cash out and that do it outside, um, outside um, the bank. Just a little bit about what our strategy is, and I think there's four key pillars there. I won't go, I'll just touch on it lightly. Look, um, pretty much it's all about the customer. 
I mean, uh, we really focus on that. We put it, and you can see it's the centre of everything we do. We try to uh, really focus on that and uh, make sure that uh, whatever we do in, in our going forward, that the, stra uh, the customer is, is really the centre of everything. I think why we do that is that, I mean, we got our, our slogan is called Together It's Possible. And we reflect on that by our, um, when our customers, they have their dreams, you know, I mean, maybe it's a new business opportunity or maybe they want to buy a house or they might want to invest in some other wealth management product. So when they come to Kena, we can talk to them and, and together it's possible. It's fair to say that our growth has really mirrored the emergence of the Papua New Guinea economy. As more of our people entered the formal economy, so there has been a demand for vehicles, white goods, payment systems, savings accounts, small business loans, investment and home ownership. As a flow on, the Papua New Guinea's fi financial service sector has really experienced strong growth. And that pretty much come about since we talked about the legislation back at the beginning of 2000. I think there's been about 20% cargo since that time. The sector is regulated by the Bank of Papua New Guinea, the country's central bank, with four commercial banks operating in the country. I spoke about Keena's commitment to compliance and governance earlier, but I think it's worth stressing here that this is helping us in a number of other ways, including the development of new and important partnerships in the Asia-Pacific region. Keena recently became Papua New Guinea's first bank to cite a trade finance agreement with the ADB. <coughs> we also announced the establishment of a new USD correspondent banking arrangement with uh, leading Asian bank COMB. Corresponding bank is really critical to banks as that enables them to trade with uh, and exchange uh, currencies with other banks. The agreements of ADB and COMB are a further demonstration of the confidence of major banks in Kena's framework for managing international transaction risks. In retail banking, I believe there's still an enormous opportunity for this sector to grow in Papua New Guinea, particularly given the sector's exposure to multinational corporates, the growth in small to medium enterprises, and the country's growing middle class. <coughs> I think we've talked about, but approximately about 70% of, of, of the country's uh, population is considered to be unbanked because of its geographical remoteness and dispersed population. Given these factors, Keener is a strong advocate of financial inclusion and the financial literacy efforts to encourage more people to be part of this financial grid. This is critical for PNG also because access to safe and affordable financial services enables low income households to manage their money and improve their livelihoods but it also contributes to economic growth and stability. We are now seeing mobile phone penetration rates at 50%. I think coverage in the country is around 95, 96%. Uh, and, telephone and telecom service partners are stepping up investments in these services to create. Uh, I believe that we've got a, a strong growth in data usage in Papua New Guinea of likes of Facebook and things like that. Uh, it was a really interesting chat this morning from Mark and I think um, what I'm really saying is that a lot of that stuff will probably happen, even though it'll take time. It really means that uh, wireless financial access is increasingly become an option um, for consumers. <coughs> I really think that branchless banking will be the future for banking in Papua New Guinea and probably in most other countries around the world. I think you see that there's a decline of ATMs now and there will be, there is a decline of FPOS machines. So and uh, it will really probably all be about uh, mobile phones in the future. We won't see those. Along these same lines, it is interesting to note that the Bank of Papua New Guinea and an Australian aid, aid uh, contractor are now looking at blockchain. I think the Governor referred to that. In fact, there was a meeting just two weeks ago, Governor, in Port Moresby to, to discuss the opportunities of blockchain and it was very widely um, attended. However, look, this is a new technology and it will not happen overnight. But I think Papua New Guinea is in a unique place that it, it, it can jump a generation of technology. So anything can happen there. <coughs> I'll talk a little bit about some of the growth opportunities I see and I think um, through quality products and 
leveraging technology and enhance our um, competitive advantage. In the funds administration area, our technology is probably first rate. It's right up there with the um, best you can get probably in Australia. It's based on a workflow system right from the front end. When a customer comes in, it can be tracked all the way through with scanning. And, uh, the purpose is, is to <coughs> get consistency, to get a, in a fast and a response and look after the member very uh, quickly. <coughs> in the funds administration area of our technology partners, we are the first in Papua New Guinea and ahead of many Australian competitors to roll out technology, which delivers a new front end website um, customizable to employer groups and a fully transactional mobile app for members. <coughs> In this area of our business, we have set a goal not just being part PNG's uh, best administrator, but we also want to compete with fund administrators operating in Australia, Asia and, and Pacific. In fact, we've started now to get uh, opportunities to quote on business in Australia, which we've declined to do so. <coughs> they actually outsource a lot to India and, and the Philippines, and they think that Papua New Guinea is a bit closer to home, so there's opportunities for growth on that side. On the banking side, we are presently progressing a number of key priorities in 2017. We are upgrading our core banking system. Uh, it'll include, uh, up, as I mentioned before, our um, personal and, corp and business banking uh, products and services and our mobile banking apps and etc. Our significant investment in system upgrades and new technologies and enhancements is designed to ensure that our services are available to our customers anytime, anywhere. I think it's probably fair to say that, and we've heard that before today, is that customers really want to control um, how they interact with the bank. They want to be able to do it whenever they want to. That's what we mean. They may want to be sitting home at midnight and they want to pay a bill or do something. That's where banking will go in the future. I'll talk a little bit about um, P&G economy, and I think, look, I'm not an expert on this, but just to quote some... St uh, information. I think it's uh, important to keep this in balance. Look, um, we do, we are continuing to face some serious economic challenges, and I think, um, but they're also based on some good opportunities going forward. I, I'd like to um, just refer to a, um, a, a, a positive story that it, uh, was about um, an improved out, uh, outlook was reflected in a um, Oxford Business Group's uh, CEO. Um, PNG CEO survey recently. And uh, it was more than 60% of those survey had either positive or very positive expectations of business conditions. <coughs> While oil and gas uh, prices remain subdued on the back of the decline in global commodity prices, opportunities for new exploration discoveries and the completion of the PNG LNG um, liquefied natural gas project have enhanced the country's investment outlook for the medium term. There has also been a shift in focus to other sectors, including sectors such as tourism, consumer services and minerals. According to the ADB, the, the PNG economy is expected to grow around 2.5% in 2017. And with APEC on next year um, and the money to be spent uh, along with that, they expect it should grow to about 2.8% in 2018. Now, we've talked a lot about the US dollar shortage and foreign currency shortage. It is the biggest balance, um, challenge facing PNG right at this stage. I think the bank recently quoted that they said in the first quarter foreign currency uh, reserves were a level of about 5.6 billion kina, and it was just about six months of total import cover, and I think it's about 10 months of uh, non-mineral um, uh, import cover. The bank also said that by the end of 2017, reserves may grow to around 6 billion. Um, <coughs> Kina. Coming back to that survey, the OBG survey, it pointed about, uh, it did point out to the ro robust activity that was occurring in a smaller and, and medium-sized enterprise segment. Another positive outline in that survey was that the business leaders surveyed by, surveyed by the OBG commented that they have uh, easy access to credit, which I think is a sign of uh, growth in that microfinance and banking sector. As I move around and, and we, on our in, investor presentations that we do for our shareholders, I'm pleased to receive feedback that Papua New Guinea remains an attractive frontier market. I think we heard Eric talking about this is an opportunity for Papua New Guinea to get out there. We compete for risk capital with places like Sri Lanka, Miramar and Mongolia, 
But I think it's fair to say that we offer a much broader array of opportunities. I think one thing that Papua New Guinea does not do very well is to promote itself, and I think they need to do that more. There are some good stories amongst all the, the other stories that we have. Beyond the LNG um, projects, and given our climate is suitable for many agricultural crops, there are many opportunities for investors in this sector. Things are looking positive for coffee producers. Last year was the strongest uh, coffee crop since 2011, and prices have generally improved over the past year. Palm oil prices have been strong, and Papua New Guinea has maintained production. Key investors such as New Britain Palm Oil, owned by uh, Malaysia's Saim Darby and Israel's uh, Innovative Agro, have shown a large-scale agribusiness can flourish in Papua New Guinea. There still remains an enormous untapped potential. Despite where PNG is currently in the economic cycle, business leaders remain positive about the longer-term prospects of the economy. A good example is cruise tourism in Papua New Guinea is also facing a bright future with increased international interest in cruising and increasing willingness from the cruise companies to put Papua New Guinea on the agenda. With the PNG election now behind us, I think we stopped doing anything since uh, probably the beginning of May until just recently. And hopefully now that we have a government that's in place and will be stable for a while, we can now get back to the business of trying to uh, run the country and focus on key service delivery. A key um, positive for Papua New Guinea will be our hosting of APEC in 2018. I think the numbers say there's around 15,000 delegates and spending an estimated 100 million kina on travel and hospitality in our country. The good, more important good news coming up shortly is the uh, Rugby League World Cup. So hopefully our team can do very well and try and achieve the success of our PNG hunters. <coughs> Just a couple of things on our priorities for this year. Obviously, we want to continue to get profitable and uh, good quality lending growth. But the most important factor for us is to get our system transformation correct and right. And I think um, we have an opportunity to sort of leapfrog um, um, a generation of, uh, of, of, of um, technology in Papua New Guinea. So it's critical that we get that right. <coughs> I'd just like to make the comment, and I think um, I think Mark and Adrian here, that banks really today are quasi-technology companies. I mean, they spend so much money on, on um, technology and we focus more on being a bank, but really it's really about the technology. We need it for not only conduct our transactions, but for compliance and audit and everything like that. So it's really key. So <clears throat> I think going forward, you'll see more and more of that. They'll end up probably becoming more of a technology company than a bank. Oops. Just in conclusion, um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity uh, to provide a better understanding of Kina and Papua New Guinea. Uh, I hope I've been able to convince you that at Kina is a great business and that PNG is a place worth thinking about as an investment destination. And for those that aren't in Papua New Guinea, I encourage you to come and visit us and have a first-hand look at what Kina and Papua New Guinea has to offer as an investment destination. Thank you very much. Thank you.